We've been in a series over the summer uh, called Press But Not Crushed. And uh, Chris was away on holidays for two weeks, and then we loaned him out to Harbor Light this week. Uh, He's over there helping out while Jeff is on holidays. Uh, But he should be back here soon. And it's been a series in 2 Corinthians, uh, really at the end of chapter 2, beginning of chapter 3 through the end of chapter 6. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm not going to rehash all of what's going on, but some of you are visiting just to catch up to speed. Paul had gone to Corinth to plant a church and uh, had done so in the face of lots of opposition from other religious leaders there. He wasn't really accepted in the synagogue. It's a lot of people coming out of different backgrounds and different, like first generation Christians, and he works with them for about a year and a half, a bunch of host churches, takes off and and things kind of go off the rails, writes them a hard letter in 1 Corinthians, calling them back to what they should be. And uh, is so worried about these, these spiritual babies, these, these people he loved and did life with, that you just see him over and over in 2 Corinthians earlier on and then later he talks about just how much it disturbed him until t- he had Titus go and return and he go, how are they doing? And they, they received it and responded and it was going well. And so in this section, he's found out that they're doing well and he's giving them uh, this huge encouragement. We, we kind of said there's 12 things that they have as they endeavor to do life and to go forward. And it's, it's all on the website or our YouTube channel. You can check it out. Uh, and so we're quite a ways into it. Last week I talked about uh, we have this perspective. Uh, he says, so I don't lose heart. And I'm just like, wow, how do you get this perspective? He's been so open and real as he goes through this passage about um, the many, many trials that they face. And we know from Acts chapter 9 that Paul's call to ministry, uh, the word for him was, you're, you're going to suffer a whole bunch. And he did. And if you jump ahead into, uh, I believe it's 11 or 12 of this book, Uh, He lists the stuff that happened to him, like shipwrecked three times and beaten this many times. And like, it's just a litany of horrible things that went on. And uh, he's just so real. And now now he's been talking about this treasure that we have in this jar, this clay pot. And then he's using these terms like outwardly we're wasting away, we're burdened, we're persecuted. And you just get the sense he's not hiding anything. He's not selling them a bill of goods. He's not saying, hey, if you do this, life won't be hard. But he's also been really clear about God's power. And this power to sustain and the glory that's within us with the spirit of God living in him. And and what this redemption and this relationship with God has meant. And how God is just more than able to meet all of these things. And so as he contrasts the problems or the difficulty of the world and the amazing power of God and the call of God and what God has done, he uses terms like this, in light of this, therefore, so then, we look to. And so last week when he made this amazing statement, we don't lose heart, uh, we asked the question, well, how on earth do we go through this life and face way less than what you face, but things that are important to us and not lose heart? And we discovered this secret where he said, we're being renewed in our inner self day by day. And remember we talked about how it's not like a camel pulling up and filling up. It's it's a daily thing and mercies of God are new every morning. He's going to give you exactly what you need for today and probably not for the rest of the week. You need to come back tomorrow. That there's this renewal that happens. And then this perspective that the difficulties we're going through are somehow preparing us. And Steve alluded to this as he talks about, man, there's two ways I could have responded to difficulty. And I remember in the elders meeting when he was, we had every guy go around and share a bit of their testimony. He said, oh, I won't say this really loudly, but uh, I am kind of appreciative that we went through COVID because of what it's produced in my life. And this perspective that the difficulties that we're going through are preparing us for something we can't even think about or compare. And then the call from Paul in not losing heart is to look to things unseen. Here's the last, here's where we ended last week. For this light momentary affliction, 
is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So today, he's going to take and flesh out a little bit for us these unseen things. Because, I mean, I'm that guy, a little bit sarcastic, a little bit whatever. And when Paul says, fix your eyes on things that are unseen, I'm like, I can't see them, Paul. I mean, I get what you're saying. Take your eyes off your circumstances. Learn these grander truths. Keep everything in perspective and in mind. But if I'm going to fix my eyes on something, I mean, anybody else a little bit ADD? You're going to, oh, there's a fly. So he does this great thing for us. In our passage today, he unpacks the unseen, what's coming. It's interesting, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about uh, when we were having our first child and how important it was that the doctor kind of said these are the things you're going to go through and this is what's going to happen and here's it and when we understood what was coming even though we hadn't gone through it yet and even though there wasn't that experience you know to go back on we had the testimony of others and we had the explanation of what was happening and we could fix our eyes on the goal the prize and go through a difficult experience. Well, more so for her than for me, admittedly. But it really helped to have the information. So let's pick up our passage in chapter 5. As he kind of lays something out for us that it's really important for us to know. As we struggle through life. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to, be put, longing to put on heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but that we would f- be further clothed, so that What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So let's take that apart a little bit and uh, find out what it is that Paul's giving them as, as a place to fix their eyes, as information they need to have, as kind of the bigger picture that they have to keep in place. First, this body isn't going the distance. Anybody identify with that? <laughs> as I get older, I identify with it. Because nobody's walking out. Uh, so he starts by calling it the tent, Right? And he, he kind of does this contrast. He, he talks about a tent and a building. Now, this may help you or it may not, but I'll tell the story. Uh, we were building our home on an acreage, and it had always been my dream to do a bunch of the work, and it was going way slower than it should have been. And uh, summer was ending, and it was starting to get cold. The kids were going back to school, and we were living in Camper Village, we had a sleeping trailer and an eating trailer with uh, pallets and some boards put over them as a deck in between them. And, uh, like, it was not good. The one trailer leaked a little bit. Bedding got shoved in a trunk. My wife was not um, digging the experience <laughs> of camping, as it were. So we shifted gears and got the basement ready to move into while we worked on the upstairs. 
and uh, had a makeshift kitchen. But when we moved in and had like carpet on the basement floor and bedrooms to sleep in and a heat that turned on and off and a hot water heater that worked, we thought we had it made. And my wife said to me, I'm going to clean the camper and then I never want to see it again. I will not again sleep in it or set foot in it. And she is true to her word. (laughs) We enjoyed our house that much more when we got into the upstairs and started to use it like it was designed for and and, and so we had this picture, and, and, but while we were in the campers, we were groaning and complaining. We were burdened. It was tough to get the kids ready for school, and it was tough to do life and to live, and we couldn't entertain and use our gifts. We felt just restricted and afflicted in every way. Now, it was a momentary trouble, and it was wonderful as it moved ahead. But Paul uses this really interesting thing. He says... You, This tent that's our earthly home, it's not meant to last. It's going to deteriorate. It's going to wear out. We live in a broken world, and while there's beauty and everything all around us, it's not what you were created for. There's more, and you know that somehow. And when he says to get your eyes up and to fix your eyes on something different, he starts out by saying, this tent, you're going to groan. You're going to long for this permanent home. You're going to be burdened during this time. It will be difficult and there's strain. And, and isn't it funny that when we get this earthly body, this tent, that when everything is about here and now and hanging on to it and this life, how we lose focus about what's important and who God is. He says, well, this tent that's our earthly home is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. I love that moment where Jesus says to his disciples, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and, and where I am, you're going to be also. And there's going to be this gathering together, this enjoyment of one another, a building from God made in the heavens. But he's also talking about something else. He's talking about the fact that is God is redeeming things as his plan is working out that we will enjoy resurrected bodies. Now, if nobody told you this, uh, scripture is full of these references and I'm not going to take a ton of time today to back up and unpack them all. But when you die, you do have an eternal being and spirit, but the promise of God is that one day you will have a resurrected body. Perfect and new. And one of the places that you could go to really investigate that is in 1 Corinthians 15. But I'll just read you just a couple verses. It says, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of man, dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And so there will come a day when God will return for his people, his church, and it says the dead in Christ will rise. There'll be this mighty resurrection, and, and we can talk about end times things here. But he's saying that new thing, uh, that's from God. So it leads me to this uh, very practical question what about the in between, Paul? Because we know that in, in other passages it says you've fallen asleep in Christ. And it, does that mean that you're just in limbo? Well, no. He's been quite clear that he says absence from the body is presence with God. And while we wait expectantly for that day of Christ's return and that day of reckoning and that day where, where there's a new heaven and a new earth, uh, we need to understand the what now in Scripture. In Luke 23, verses 42, uh, 41 and 42, I believe it is, Jesus says, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. And when Paul uses the term here, naked, I, I want you to think of it this way, that we, we've got somewhere for our soul to re- reside in this body, and when this tent, when this thing is done, we will be present with the Lord in spirit and soul, and waiting the time with, for the new body and for the new resurrected earth when things are done 
And you can explore that, and it's a good picture. But you need to understand this. You need to get this clear in your head. When it says, fix your eyes on the unseen, this is what's coming. This is how Scripture unpacks it. This is what's going on. Just an aside, in in another place, he talks about those escaping as through the flames and uh, arriving that they've understood what God did for them, but they just get there. And so he goes on to unpack something that's really important. Well, first he starts with our guarantee. He says, the living spirit of God is in you and affirms truth in your soul. He leads you, he reveals, he equips. And that word guarantee is almost like a down payment on something that's coming, if you pulled it apart in the Greek. But as you need to know all of the different details, this tent's not going to last. You are going to die. You're not walking out of here. Yes, your soul's eternal. Yes, there'll be a resurrected body. Yes, that's all coming. And don't miss this. When that all happens, there will be something called the judgment seat of Christ. So verse 10, he talks about this here. But in Hebrews 9.27, it says, It's appointed for mankind to die and after that to face judgment. Two aims at this judgment thing. See, two things happening. We know as he separates the sheep and the goats, there's a book of life, is your name written there. There will be a declaration of God for who is saved and who is lost. Is your name in the book of life? And so there will be that initial division, and then there will be something else. Our deeds will be exposed, and there will be a reward for the faithful. Now, if you want to walk through Scripture, this is over and over and over in the New Testament. Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. You can check Revelation 22, 21, Ephesians 6, 8, 1 Corinthians 3, 8, or go to Jesus telling the parable of the talents when the master returns and they're rewarded or judged based on what they did with what they had. Now, you all know that fairness and justice dictates that how we lived our lives, what we did with what was entrusted to us, that that's going to be rewarded in heaven. When we rule and reign with Christ, when everything's set right, what you did with a short amount of time, however much he, grant, he granted to you, you had two, two or three big decisions. Would I accept the payment for sin made on my behalf? Would I enter into this relationship with God? And then we like to sell some kind of a fairness model where we say, well, everybody uh, will probably have the same. And it doesn't say that. It says there'll be a reward. That they'll be well done, thou good and faithful servant. That things will be exposed for what they are. Now, that'll make some of you uncomfortable because you come from a theology or a background that says, man, as long as one day I pray the prayer at the right time or make this acceptance in my heart that this is for me, I'm in. And once I'm into heaven, it's all good. Well, it is all good. There's no more tears. There's no more sorrow. Do a little, ex- do a little expositional work on heaven. But it never once says it's all fair or even. And that he'll reward his servants and that he's asking for a return for what he's entrusted you. This becomes super important when we begin to choose what we fix our eyes on. You see, you need to know all this information. I was talking to somebody who bought a new vehicle the other day. And uh, they were trying to make a decision between all the undercoating and all that. And they kept telling them what was going to happen. I said, what you should do, especially because it's a Ford. Um, <laughs> sorry. That was uncalled for, but it was funny. <laughs> is find one at five years and 10 years and 15 years and ask if they got that undercoating done and see what's under there in our environment. You see, if you knew what was coming and what was going to happen, you'd make a really good decision with what you did here. Yeah? So I was someone else and they were telling me about currencies and economies and they're way smarter than I am and this crypto thing 
And I said, man, I'd love to have a crystal ball to know what's coming (laughs) so I could make a wise investment now. And then, like a rock, it just landed on my head because I've been preparing for this message. You do have a crystal ball. Nothing in this world is going to last. It's all tomorrow's yard sale. It's destined for the fire. (laughs) There's a new heaven and a new earth. And there's a treasure that lasts forever where moth and rust doesn't destroy. And what you treasure is often what you fix your eyes on. Hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. Does that mean that we just swing hard the other way and chuck it? (laughs) And say, well, we're not called to be good stewards? No, we're called to be great stewards. We're not called to be wise in our... Yes, we're called to be wise with our money and our investing and all of that stuff. That we're not called... Yes, we're called to keep all of that in view. But he talks about the difficulty of our world and the unsettledness of what happens as things go up and down and we don't know what God's up to and we're perplexed. And he's speaking to these loved ones in this church knowing that this is inspired by the Holy Spirit and it's for us in our time. He's saying, here's some things to keep keep in mind. You're not going to lose heart and you need to fix your eyes on the things that are unseen. And here's what's coming. This tent isn't going to make it. You can't save it. We're all going out the same way. It's part of the curse. Yes, we will be with the Father and there's coming a day when all will be made right. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth where we'll rise, we'll, be, we'll have a resurrected body. Mine's going to look great. I've been talking to him about it. And we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ, not fearful as those, as those children. He said, well, your name written there, yes, Jesus is between us and our sin. It's forgiven. It's as removed as far as the east is from the west. But there's an additional responsibility. You are not saved by your work. You're saved by Christ's work on the cross. You will be asked, and there is a reward. What did you do with what I entrusted you? And we will be at the judgment seat of Christ with two aims. Is your name in the book? And exposing what's going to last. And he says this, in spite of these realities, in spite of knowing this, now that we fix our eyes on it, three cool things. First, he says, we're of good courage, Right? If the world situation is falling apart, if pandemics ebb and flow, it doesn't matter. Disturbing situations, troubling times, there's no despair here. And when I think of Marie and her Facebook posts over discovering this lump and having to go through all this travel at 87 years old, she's like doing these days in hotels and lockdown and nobody's with her in Bangkok when she's getting her surgery and I'm just like, and she's not despairing a bit. Her, her posts are encouraging. And she's writing out, oh, I got this song from Jesus that you should listen to it. It's so great. Though the earth would be shaking and God doing perplexing things, we can't figure out how this fits. What does it mean for our freedoms and for our society? And, and what do you want me to do? We can be of good courage. Because our eyes are fixed on the outcome. And we can trust that the troubles are producing something in us. Secondly, he says, we walk by faith, not by sight. That when we keep our eyes on the truth and we view our circumstances through that, not on the circumstances trying to invent a truth that fits it. When we walk by faith, not by sight, we know that this is leading to matters that we need to keep in mind. Uh, Just, yeah, I'll take time for this. The term walk is an active term. And, And I want you to know that that means faith and deeds are connected in James. And that, that it actually affects what you do with your time and your energies and your service and your, and walking by faith is actually investing in something. It's, it's moving forward. Because the temptation for us is to hunker down. To know that there's something better coming. 
to know the end game, to know that God is preparing a place for me and that, that this is going to happen. The temptation then is to gather and be encouraged alone and to hunker down and to build a moat and protect. And that's not what he's asked us to do. He's asked us to be agents of reconciliation. We get to talk about that next week. He's asked us to go out and to take the message to those that are lost because they matter to him. And then it says in the passage, make it your aim to please him. You should read that verse just so you hear it. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. It speaks of your heart and your intention. What we invest in, how we represent the Father in all things, our aim is to please him. Paul puts it this way in Philippians as he's writing chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. For your progress, your joy, and joy in the faith. Well, let's ask the big question. So what? So what? Yeah. Um, what I don't want you to do is be bummed out. <laughs> I, I, as we go through, we just preach what's in the word, and it's there. And I, I'm, I wish I could tell you, you know, Oh, don't panic about these things. But these are big, important truths that we should take very seriously. So my plea as your pastor is this. Get a clear picture of what you should be focusing on. Um, Some of you, as you sit here, will be uh, your inner lawyers going, hey, somebody told you this, or didn't you think this? Fine, get your word out. Have a look at what he says about what's coming. Get a clear picture about what, what's the unseen, what's, what's ahead. Uh, the Bible's been completely clear about it. It's so far, it's so much easier for me to go through something when I know why I'm in the process and what the outcome's supposed to be. From a test to a surgery to anything. And as difficult as the preparation or the pain is to know why you're doing it and what the outcome is, is just so important. If you've neglected this because of a fear of looking beyond this tent, if, you, if that reality that this tent isn't going to last and that we all go out through death and that there's a process after that and we're eternal, I, I just exhort you, I encourage you, I plead with you, look into it, get a good picture of what you're to fix your eyes on. Walking by faith is difficult, especially if you don't understand your faith. (laughs) We need to know what's promised, what's coming, and we need to have this clarifying reality in our life that there will be a day when we stand before our Father, our Jesus, who did so much for us. And we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There's a day when the things that he's asked you to do there were seemingly people took advantage of you or oh, I just and you just said yes and you walked in obedience there's a day of reward for those things too a day, a day of return where he's back personally a day of judgment where all this stuff that you wonder how did that injustice be let go it, it wasn't it'll be a day of reckoning and a day of reward And so what's coming can captivate us. It can cause us to, like Paul says, these two things within me are, it's like, oh, I'm so tired of the struggle here. I just want to get there. 
let me just encourage you, embrace where he has you. It says in Ephesians 2.10, he's prepared works for you to participate in. He's given you gifts. Walk into that, embrace it. Secondly, I want to tell you about the importance of the Holy Spirit in this. We kind of just touched on this first, that he's giving you the Spirit as a guarantee. The role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the, of the believer reveals truth. It convicts us in, you know, it shows us where we believe lies. It convicts us about things in our actions and what we're doing. He speaks to us and guides us through the scriptures and through learning to listen to Jesus. He's living and active in your life. He's empowering us. He's gifting us. He's comforting us. He's guiding us. And if you're not spending any time listening to the voice of the Spirit, learning about how to um, hear from Him, allowing Him to speak into your life, you need to do that. It's just the absolute engine that runs this. It's the, the empowerment. And then three things to take away. I don't know what you face today. Paul's saying if you can get your perspective right, you're not going to lose heart. And you can have the courage to face. I mean, I walked with a family yesterday where we said goodbye to someone that was really loved and important to them that was 46, 47. And cancer destroyed, right? The courage to face illness, the courage to face, you're going to need this spirit and this perspective. Secondly, walk. Some of you, I gotta be careful how, ah, I'll sit on the chair so then it makes it somewhat better. Some of us forget. And we can get so busy accumulating in life and experiencing in life and, and trying to patch our tent and do things here and our hearts become captured by things. You know, the Bible talks about like weeds growing up that need to be plucked out, where we need to see clearly again. We need, sort of need to refocus. Don't sit there and beat yourself up. Uh, I love when Scripture says, when we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's removed as far as the east is from the west. If you're convicted at all, it's Jesus calling you to return to the important things not beating you up for where you are. He loves you. My sheep know my voice. They follow it. But walk. Would your faith become deeds and actions? Would the things you believe, would the love God's expressed for you, the forgiveness he's given you, the gifts he's given you be employed representing him both within and outside the body? And my final exhortation would be this. We need to make it our aim to please God. Oh, to stand there and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let me pray. Father, it's your truth, it's your word. Would your spirit now um, do the work in hearts? And would you hear from us as we respond? Would you receive our worship? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.